Thanks for joining in uh, our current series of virtual talks at a time of pandemic. And thanks to our associate members and others who have sent in some questions for the discussion period after the talk. So it's great to have um, the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC, CMG, back at the Institute. He's spoken here quite a few times before. And today the topic of the talk is COVID-19 and the challenge for the courts. Michael Kirby is very well known, one of the best known Australians. So I'll introduce him briefly. He was a solicitor, became a barrister, head of the Australian Law Reform Commission, 75 to 1984, on the New South Wales Court of Appeal, 1984 to 96, and of course as a High Court judge from 1996 to 2009. Since then he's been very active, including with international bodies, uh, such as the Global Commission for HIV and the Law, the Commission of Inquiry into North Korea, which uh, Michael Kirby spoke at the Institute on a couple of occasions, and he's currently co-chair of the International Bar Association Human Rights Institute based in London. And Michael Kirby comes back again, as I said, to talk about COVID-19 and the challenge of the courts. He'll talk for around half an hour, and then we'll go to questions and discussion. Uh, Michael Kirby, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gerard, and thank you to the Sydney Institute for continuing its magnificent work to bring issues and challenges uh, and uh, different points of view to the Australian community. Um, uh, these series of lectures are being held in a time of COVID-19, the name that was given by the World Health Organization to uh, this strange virus which has so uh, radically changed our lives. Uh, when I think back on where we were a year ago, of the issues uh, in the international community and in our domestic Australian community, and then compare it uh, to the obsessive situation that we're in today with this very worrying and frightening epidemic. Uh, it's a very different time and everyone must adjust to it, and that includes the judges and the courts. Um, in 2019, in fact, in middle of November 2019, a strange uh, form of pneumonia was detected in hospitals in Wuhan, in China. And this uh, infection uh, began to cause alarm to some of the healthcare workers. Uh, that led to threats to them that they were troublemakers and that they should not cause panic uh, and stop talking about it. Uh, and um, that led to an attempt to suppress the knowledge of the epidemic. That in turn uh, worked for a while, but not for too long because too many people were getting sick, many of them whose lives could be traced to a wet market in Wuhan. Uh, and as a consequence, eventually the Chinese government on the last day of 2019 notified, as uh, countries had agreed to do, uh, the uh, pandemic, or then the epidemic, to the World Health Organization. And since then, the international community has been responding, monitoring, and considering the consequences of the epidemic for all uh, humanity. Um, the epidemic has spread um, in all countries, uh, but particularly uh, in the United States of America, in countries of Europe, uh, and uh, in some countries in Asia. Uh, the figures uh, are amazing. Uh, for such an epidemic. Within one year, 21 million people have been infected, and that's probably a serious understatement. Uh, and uh, of the 21 million, 776,000 have been diagnosed as having died as a consequence of their exposure to the virus that uh, causes the COVID-19 uh, symptoms. The United States of America has seen five and a half million people infected uh, and 166,000 dead. Uh, and in Australia, we've had a much smaller epidemic, 23 uh, 
7,000 uh, uh, people, 237,000 people uh, infected, and the level of deaths, 438 as of today. 438 is a very low level uh, of mortality, and I think most Australians would acknowledge that the response, uh, particularly of our federal government, but also of our state governments and premiers, uh, working together on this epidemic has meant that we have done much better than most countries in the world. But uh, like all uh, countries, certainly all countries like Australia, we have a lot of people who are affected by uh, COVID-19 and our economy is greatly affected and our social life and legal system have been affected. And I'm here today to speak about uh, the effect on the legal system and on the law. Uh, I can do that from a background, uh, as Jared Henderson has mentioned, of having worked on a number of bodies in the United Nations system on HIV and AIDS. HIV is a viral condition. Uh, and when it came along in the mid-1980s, uh, it uh, led to the um, assembling of a commission in Geneva by the World Health Organization. This was the Global Commission on AIDS. And I had the privilege of working there with uh, two scientists who were very important in discovering the virus, human immunodeficiency virus, and that led to um, uh, the predictions which the scientists made at the first meeting of the WHO Commission that within uh, 20 years we would have a, a vaccine and a cure. Well, here we are 40 years later, we don't have a vaccine and we don't have a cure. Uh, and I mention that because um, viruses are very tricky uh, targets for scientists and finding uh, a vaccine and finding a cure is not easy. You can have all the brain power of the world focused upon it, but actually succeeding uh, in uh, finding the vaccine or finding the cure is not, uh, not an easy task. And at the moment, uh, there are, I saw in the uh, media this morning, uh, there's something like 170 projects in the world to discover an effective vaccine against uh, COVID-19, uh, but uh, I will be surprised if that is done as quickly as some of the more optimistic statements that are being made. Um, that being the case, um, what you have to do with a, a viral condition is to address yourself to who are getting the condition uh, and how is it spread and what can you do absent uh, pharmaceuticals that work or absent a vaccine to prevent the spread of it. <clears throat> now with HIV that had particular difficulties because of the fact that many of the people who were exposed to HIV were in particular groups that were rather unpopular in many communities. Gay men, people who inject drugs, sex workers, uh, and uh, transgender people. Uh, the modes of transmission were very intimate and generally involved sexual or exchange of blood products. Uh, and um, uh, that uh, meant that it was quite a difficult virus to catch, but uh, those who caught it were people who were put out of reach because of the antipathy and hostility towards them uh, in their communities. And that's why early in the piece, the World Health Organization uh, put forward uh, the proposals for how uh, the epidemic of HIV could be tackled uh, without a vaccine and without uh, Cure. And that led to efforts by the uh, international community to be a bit more friendly to the people who were on the receiving end of the virus. Uh, and similar strategies have been tried in the case.
case of COVID-19. So who are the people who catch the COVID-19 uh, to the extent that they are seriously uh, damaged and compromised and therefore likely to suffer uh, and to die as a result of being exposed. Uh, those people are a cross-section of the community. Uh, the people who are worst affected are generally uh, aged people, often in aged care facilities, usually over 70, those we've seen recently in Australia, uh, increasing numbers of younger people uh, reporting with uh, serious complications and even some deaths. Uh, uh, but generally with compromised um, lung or um, heart conditions or with diabetes. So these are the targets, and this is a very nasty little virus that latches on to the compromised condition and in those cases can lead to deaths in large numbers. And the way therefore to stop uh, the spread of the epidemic uh, is um, to try to prevent the uh, social circumstances in which it's likely that the person will catch uh, the virus. And that means lockdowns and a form of mini uh, quarantine, which is the traditional way in which societies back to biblical times would uh, deal with the challenge of uh, an epidemic. Uh, and so um, in Australia, uh, we re reacted very well uh, and quite quickly uh, to the presence of the uh, epidemic and we were benefited by the fact that we were an island. Um, I can't say all islands did well, though many in the Pacific also uh, benefited from being an island. Um, New Zealand, uh, series of islands uh, also did well. You can lock yourself off to a some extent for the rest of the world. But if you're in Europe or uh, if you're in a big continental country like the United States or Brazil, uh, it's much more difficult. And the result has been that in those countries that can't lock themselves off, off or won't lock themselves off, uh, that the virus has spread and the numbers of people infected has been extremely serious. And so the question then becomes what can you do in society to stop people coming into close contact with each other, being in the space of others uh, for uh, a period of time and spreading the droplets um, to themselves and to others that carry the virus. And that without the vaccine or the cure that really is what we've had to concentrate on. Uh, and uh, closing down the huge sports jamborees has been one of the ways of reducing the danger of spreading the virus, but also uh, in social engagements, uh, even within families, but similarly in uh, social engagements in places where people are close, put close together, such as in the courts, they have to make modifications. And that brings me to the modifications which we've adopted in Australia, in our courts, uh, to respond to COVID-19 uh, in order to reduce the risks of spreading the virus. Uh, we have an institutional memory of this problem. It arose from the Spanish flu in 1918 in Australia just after the First World War. At that time, similar efforts were made by the courts to cut down on the spread of that particular virus. Uh, and uh, people were encouraged to keep a distance and also to wear masks. In one case, um, the Banco Court in Sydney was conducted by three judges sitting there in that beautiful courtroom, which is still uh, in St James's Road uh, and the judges were not wearing masks and the Minister for Health rose in the Parliament and solemnly denounced the judges for not wearing masks and said that you are not above the law but uh, the Chief Justice very gently reminded 
uh, the Minister of Health that the Attorney General, his colleague, had sent a letter saying that the judges didn't have to uh, wear masks because they've got to ask questions uh, and that the barristers uh, should wear masks. But um, in court, when they were in the middle of doing their job, uh, they could be excused. So um, the, the memory of 1918 uh, was there when uh, COVID-19 struck uh, and when the effort was made to find a response from the courts that would allow them to do their job, which is very much a job of inter interface of human beings discussing uh, and arguing. Uh, and, uh, and in every level of the courts <coughs> in our nation, from the High Court of Australia to the local magistrates' courts, uh, big changes have been made. And it's really quite amazing how quickly the changes have been made. Uh, in the High Court of Australia, uh, when I was on the court, uh, there was the system of video linkage to um, all parts of the Commonwealth uh, for the purpose of allowing barristers to appear in a courtroom in Darwin or in Perth or in Hobart and make representations, but that was limited to special leave applications uh, seeking to get into uh, the High Court. Uh, it wasn't used for the purpose of actual hearings. But when COVID-19 came along, the technology uh, that had been used in those days and still used for special leave applications was extended to uh, hearings. And in March 2020, the High Court of Australia stopped having hearings uh, in the courtrooms uh, and uh, led, that led to um, hearings that were linked by uh, the uh, audio-visual uh, link uh, through the different systems that are now available to link different places. Um, and uh, the technology of Zoom and of Teams uh, it was uh, put to work. Uh, and uh, the judges of the High Court would sit in a courtroom in their own state uh, and be linked to barristers who would sit in their chambers uh, or go to a local courtroom and make their representations in that way. Similar methodology was used in the Federal Court of Australia, uh, the National uh, Federal Court, uh, and uh, was used there not only in the um, arguments on appeal, which is very re readily adapted to uh, argument by long distance, but also arguments in trials because of the civil nature of most of the jurisdiction in the federal court. Uh, and uh, likewise in the state courts, because the state courts perform many of the criminal uh, jurisdiction functions, particular difficulties were faced uh, with uh, jury trial and for, uh, to a large extent jury trials in criminal cases have been uh, postponed uh, or delayed because of the difficulty of having a jury function with the close intimate contact that juries have in considering uh, the um, arguments uh, in a criminal trial. But in a criminal appeal, uh, the Court of Criminal Appeal has proceeded to hear cases. The judges sit, uh, three of them usually, uh, in their red robes. On crime, you wear red. In civil cases, you wear black. Uh, and the criminal judges generally sit uh, as three in the Banco Court, the self-same Banco Court, which in 1918 caused the ire of the uh, State Minister for Health. But um, the so the Court of Appeal, which undertakes civil cases, uh, has had an easier task and often uh, one judge of appeal will sit presiding in the President's Court or the Court of Appeal uh, courtroom and uh, two other judges will join by a link, mostly from their uh, chambers in the Law Courts building uh, and that is the way uh, the reduction in the exposure to the risk of contact has been uh, 
uh, achieved. Uh, this has gone so far that recently, when the Australian Society of Computers and the Law was established, uh, a distinguished professor from England, Professor Richard Suskind, who has been writing uh, extensively about the issues of um, improving our legal system generally, uh, has seen in the developments that have occurred in the United Kingdom and in Australia uh, an opportunity for us to rethink some of the procedures that we have in our courts of law uh, in order that <coughs> armed with the experience of distant uh, communication uh, through Skype uh, and uh, through uh, the systems of um, Zoom and uh, Teams uh, to see in that a way to break uh, the uh, infatuation with past procedures and to face up to the particular problems that courts have in delivering their product, the product of justice, to the people who come to them. And so uh, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom has done exactly the same as the High Court of Australia. It hasn't had a physical hearing since March uh, 2020. But the result has been that uh, the Professor Suskind, who is giving advice to the Chief Justice of the United Kingdom, has said, here is our opportunity. We should uh, face the fact that lawyers can adapt, have adapted uh, to distance communication, and look at new ways to uh, get the courts more user-friendly for the citizens who need them. And uh, Professor Suskind has said that there are three basic problems for our way of delivering justice. Problem number one is the delays that are built into the court procedures, in part by the fact that judges uh, tend to be available only between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And he says if we can have more judges available at different times, including at other times that may be more convenient, to the litigants, that may be a better way uh, to deliver the product. Um, the second problem he's identified is costs. Our legal system is uh, pretty good when you get to it, but it tends to be a very costly legal system because it depends on barristers or advocates or solicitors mediating the problem in communication with a judge or with a jury or a judge and jury. And that is uh, the problem which Professor Suskin said we should try to overcome now that we're getting used to different technology in the way we do court business. But the third problem is the more fundamental. And the third problem is access to justice. For many people, including middle class people who have an income, uh, going to court is ferociously expensive uh, and is so expensive that most judges would tell you that the last thing they would do if they had a problem would be to go to court. They would try to avoid court, if I can say so, like the plague. And they would try to avoid it because it's so terribly expensive. And then, even if you succeed at first instance, there may be an appeal and then there may even be a further appeal to the highest court. And so these are reasons why Professor Suskin said, we've got to look to China and to other countries which are increasingly using automated decision-making. Uh, computing machines will analyze the facts uh, of a case. The facts will be fed in uh, by user-friendly friendly technology. Uh, litigants may be able to bypass advocates. They may be able to feed in their facts. The questions put to them will chart their way through the complicated problems to get in the main points in, uh, to the machine and thereby uh, they will be able to do uh, the case much more cost effectively. And that will make the product more practically available not just theoretically available, but practically available to the ordinary citizen. Uh, and Professor Suskind put forward these propositions 
And I think uh, the audience that was listening to him in Australia was pretty convinced that when COVID-19 goes away, there's no risk that courts, having experienced, and judges and barristers having experienced the new technology of speaking to a screen, or speaking as I now am to a camera, is something which once you get used to it, you just go on and plough on and you do it. And that is something that lawyers will have to adapt to and will adapt to, and that will become a much more common feature. And Professor Susskind said, why do we go to a courtroom or a courthouse uh, when people can reach nowadays uh, the decision makers in a much more cost-effective way? And he says, learn from the computer communication for the more deep question of how we deliver the product of justice in the complicated trial. Uh, and uh, he says that is something which we need to focus on uh, as a bright light that may come out of the otherwise dark shadows of COVID number 19. Uh, now, uh, there's a lot of sense in what he says. Uh, and at the uh, discussion uh, that took place by uh, a Zoom conference, uh, it, uh, with people from all parts of the world, not just Australia, uh, talking with uh, Professor Susskind about his ideas, a number of problems were raised, and I'm just going to tick those problems off so that you can keep them in mind. Essentially, there's always been a solution to the problem of the costs of uh, litigation, and that solution was the solution provided by the French legal system the civilian legal system, the civil law, is against the common law of England. Uh, and the civil law uh, provides a, a mechanism whereby judges can um, uh, become part of an active cohort who are interrogating and getting the information uh, when uh, the litigants or their representatives don't do so. This is the inquisitorial system. Uh, and uh, that uh, has been advocated many times, but there seems to be something in the history of uh, English-speaking people. They're very suspicious of inquisitorial systems. Uh, a German judge who came to Australia in the 1980s said at a conference, you have a wonderful legal system in Australia. I pay tribute to your legal system. Your system is, in fact, a Rolls-Royce system. In Germany, he says, we only have a Volkswagen of a legal system. Our judges are really just lower level officials and they uh, engage with the parties and guide them through and supplement uh, the evidence that they call and make sure they get to justice. But he said, how many people can afford a Rolls-Royce? Uh, with barristers mediating to the judge and how many can afford a Volkswagen where people drive themselves. And therefore that is the question uh, and essentially it seems to me Professor Susskind is sort of arguing that we should go back to uh, the uh, issue of in, in inquisitorial legal procedure. He comes from Scotland originally himself uh, although he now has chairs at Harvard University and other universities. But Scotland has always had a distinctive legal system and has been greatly influenced by the European civilian tradition. Another problem with the civilian tradition is they don't have dissent. Now, such a system would not be terribly congenial to me, but a country that doesn't have dissent can be more efficient. You can definitely deliver the product more effectively if everybody uh, is really obliged to try uh, desperately to agree and to sink any difference that they have. But the problem uh, from the point of view of English speaking people is that dissent is an internal mechanism for correction of the legal system and for questioning the way the legal system has developed. The Marbo case on native title would never have come out of a system where there could not be dissent or there could not be disagreement by the judges. Justice Dawson in the Marbo case dissented strongly, uh, but the other judges said uh, it is no longer a principle of the common law 
people that the Aboriginal people have no interest in their land uh, and are uncivilised nomads and therefore don't have to have their land rights protected. The High Court uh, said it must be protected and it has been since 1992. So uh, borrowing systems that have been adapted in different countries uh, may not be so, such a good idea or it may need to be done with severe um, pruning and severe adaptation. It's not coincidental that when uh, the People's Republic of China indicated that it was going to impose on the people of Hong Kong who had uh, had the benefit of the uh, inefficient and semi-costly procedures of the English common law, uh, the Chinese security law, it brought uh, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people out onto the streets in protest because they said in China the judges never or very rarely uh, acquit a person, whereas in our system in Hong Kong, if there is a reasonable doubt, the judge will acquit. Building in to any automated system, the principle of uh, a system that is responsive to change, and responsive to new ideas, and responsive to human justice, and uh, to the need for justice, is something people value, especially if they have had them. And therefore the problem uh, of adapting our legal system, as Professor Susskind would have us do, uh, is not so much using distance communication, which is just another way of doing communication to a court. The problem is how do we keep the independent judge uh, and the self-critical judge and the dissenting judge in a system which is dedicated uh, above all to efficiency. Efficiency is important, but it's not the only value in a court of law. Justice is a very important value. Uh, but the Chinese would say, okay, justice is a very important value, but if you can't afford to get to it, then you're not getting that value. And there's truth in that. So there's truth in what Professor Susskind has been saying to the Australian legal profession, but there's also truth uh, in the proposition that our system has built-in mechanisms for achieving deep-lying values which are important values for our sense of justice. Now finally, what can we do about this? <clears throat> First of all, uh, the Australian Law Reform Commission, uh, which is the national report, a reporting body that reports to the Federal Parliament and Attorney General on ways of improving our legal system, has uh, urged the Federal Attorney General to give the Commission uh, a reference to um, uh, look at um, algorithms and automated uh, decision-making systems uh, and to see to what extent that they can be adopted and applied in a system with our strong traditions. Um, that has not yet been decided by uh, Mr Porter, the Federal Attorney General, but I hope it will be decided quickly and uh, that it will be decided in favour of giving uh, the reference on automated decision making. Uh, pretty obviously it would be difficult to apply uh, such a system to a big criminal trial of a serious criminal offence and especially uh, offences which have traditionally or by the federal constitution in federal cases must be decided by a jury. But uh, many cases are not in that league and there's a lesson for us from China in the way in which they can process by automatic decision making uh, the uh, cases that are important to ordinary people which they cannot now afford to bring to a court of law. And how would we carry forward any inquiry by the Law Reform Commission. Well, it would follow the normal procedures that were laid down in the time that I was the chairman back in the 1970s, 80s. It would consult the experts, but it would also consult the public. And it would use uh, bodies like the Sydney Institute to bring the problem to the community so that people could come forward with their own points of view. And that 
would be very useful uh, from the point of view of the Commission. If we've learned one thing from our exposure to COVID-19 in Australia, uh, it is why is it that we did better? Why did we do better in tackling COVID-19? I think one of the reasons that we in New Zealand did better was because our governments uh, reached out for the community and virtually every night there was the Prime Minister with the top health minister and also the top health advisors uh, and they were telling us frankly of mistakes that had been made, apologising for mistakes. They were rendering themselves accountable by distant communication. They were bringing the problem uh, into the homes of ordinary citizens. They were talking about the difficulties of adapting uh, solutions to a country that has settled ways of dealing with health crises. Uh, and they were trying to learn from the earlier experience where Australia did better than most uh, in tackling HIV and AIDS. And this, I think, is something that we in the law can learn from. How could we do better? in tackling an issue such as automated decision-making or making courts of law cheaper and more accessible, as Professor Richard Susskind has urged. Well, I think we could learn from the way Australia, uh, both at a federal and state level, has uh, responded to the COVID-19 by engagement with the community, by engaging with the experts, by having the experts present to answer questions, uh, and by facing up to the subtle and not so subtle challenges of getting change, and in particular in professional circumstances where there will often be traditionalists who don't want any change. And that is basically what I came to say. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has been a terrible and frightening condition and many have died. But in Australia, we did better, and we can learn from that for tackling other problems in our country, including the problems of getting people to justice, including in the courts. So many thanks to the Honourable Michael Kirby for a, a challenging paper in a number of respects. We're now coming to the question discussion period. Thanks to our social members who sent in some questions. And I should say that uh, Michael Kirby's talk, which he has also given us a printed version of what he said, uh, off the cuff today will be published in due course in the Sydney Papers online. So uh, now we're off to questions and discussion. Thank you. So thanks for a stimulating address. You um, obviously from what you say in your talk, you can see not a benefit but an opportunity out of COVID-19 for reform. So let's go through a few of those areas. I mean. Do you think it's likely, for example, that the New South Wales Court of Appeal that you mentioned, or the High Court that you spoke about, will change, will say in 2022, be doing what they were doing in 2020, or do you think it'll all just go back to normal? I think it probably will all go back to normal because Lord Breed, the President of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, has said, well, the Distance uh, communication has worked very well and uh, we're quite happy with it and we don't mind doing it, but we're looking forward to getting back together. Uh, and that is a feature of, um, of the judicial life that uh, it's a pretty lonely existence because of the fact that you have an individual duty to resolve cases. You have to try and reach agreement with your colleagues, but just the discussion and engagement with other colleagues and talking things through with other colleagues, uh, which is much more easy in a normal court situation, uh, is both a valuable and a pleasant aspect of uh, the judicial experience. Uh, so I think that will drive people back. The inherent conservatism of law will probably drive people back. The fact, for example, that when they sit uh, by distance hearing in the Court of Appeal, they'll robe up uh, and not, um, not just sit there in, a, in, in 
Mufti group, yes. uh, that's showing the deep desire to try to make the thing look like a real court and, and remind them of the fact that it is a real court, remind the judges. So um, uh, there will be pressures to go back to things business as usual, but I do think people have been surprised um, by the value. I've been surprised by the large numbers of seminars that are now being held by uh, Zoom and um, Microsoft Teams. Uh, that never happened before and now it can happen so easily and now it can reach out across continents to get people like Richard Suskin to take a part uh, that uh, might have been rather difficult in earlier times. So there are real advantages in doing discussion and communication. Uh, whether uh, he's very, uh, Suskind is very optimistic that lawyers having changed, they'll change again and they'll change further. I'm not quite so sure that they'll do that. And in any case, I do think he is a bit inclined to undervalue the, uh, the problem particularly in the case of criminal trials and jury trials, mm -hmm. and particularly, for example, in the case of letting the public have access to courts. If you want to get access to um, a, a court, the, the list of the federal court has the phone number you can ring to listen to, the phone, uh, to audio. But if you actually want the video, you have to apply to the associate of the judge uh, who is in charge of the case. So, uh, and that is an inhibition on public access that hasn't existed up to now. And I think public access to scrutinise the judges whilst they are judging is a very important feature we've inherited from the common law tradition. Well, tell us, go back to your initial point there, tell us about the loan and the loneliness of the long-serving judge. I mean, for example, there are a couple of high court positions coming up in a few months or so, and I mean, let's say someone who's a practicing barrister gets that appointment, or an academic gets that appointment, uh, someone other than an existing judge. They go, they virtually have to drop their circular friends and contacts in the legal profession, don't they? So then it becomes pretty lonely, or, or were you able to associate with uh, barristers and solicitors when you're on the court? Well, it's, it's interesting you ask that question because uh, uh, there has been a tradition that uh, a barrister is like a potential judge in waiting and they know the rules, they will not embarrass the, the judge they have lunch with. Uh, in the old days, you know, there was a common room in the uh, bar's central building, Wentworth Chambers in Sydney, and, and all of us used to go down there at lunchtime. <clears throat> you, you might have a bowl of soup or a sandwich, but you would sit at any table, and then you might be sitting with a high court judge and a magistrate, and that was a wonderful feature of life at the bar when I was starting out. That died away in the 1980s, I think, and it doesn't exist now. There are the restaurants nearby, but there isn't that communal life. But it's not considered inappropriate for judges to uh, mix with um, with other practitioners, particularly with barristers, and, and that does happen. So I don't want to overstate the loneliness. The loneliness is more that you're so busy uh, and you're so concentrating on getting the reasons out quickly. One of the one of the perils that Professor Sussman mentions. Um, that you tend not to find time to make a lot of contacts and that drives you back into your family or your partner and, and that means you're not uh, having the same um, vigorous social life that you had before and of course there are some things you can't do. One of the rules I was told soon after I was appointed was you're not allowed to go to a, 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 a hotel, a pub, and because uh, I never went to pubs anyway. <laughs> yes. I, I didn't uh, feel that that was a huge loss for me, but for some people, not going to pubs was a difficulty, so they abandoned pubs and they joined clubs. And actually, they were much more likely to get
get bumped into uh, yes. people who are in litigation in a pub yes. than they are in a pub. Unless they're in the criminal jurisdiction, of course. <laughs> you might you might find more crims in pubs than in clubs, I guess. But well, you're not I'm sure. not sure about <laughs> that. I don't, we won't go there. <laughs> I'm not a member of any club because uh, the clubs I would be interested in being a member of don't admit women. And uh, that, I think, is something that is... Uh, is not acceptable nowadays. Take us back, you, you mentioned the criminal law, so um, let's look first at, at juries. As you know, um, there's a trial by judge alone in all jurisdictions in Australia except Victoria and Tasmania. So they have judge by tri uh, ju judge, trial by jury only. But Victoria's making exceptions because of COVID-19 and some people can make application now to have a trial by judge alone because juries in Victoria are up, I'm not sure right now, well it would be so right now, but quite early on in the COVID-19 uh, jury trials were postponed in Victoria. So the concept of trial by judge alone, which we've now got, I'm not sure about Tasmania, we now for, for a while at least have got in all Australian jurisdictions, that eliminates the jury, because the juries can't get close to one another. I think in New South Wales they are going on, but I don't, you know more about jury rooms than I do. I'm not sure how juries can sort of meet in these kind of restrictions. How do you are, you, are you an advocate for trial by jury or do you see the point of trial by judge alone? Well, I see the point of trial by judge alone. Again, this is an, if you apply an efficiency criterion, there are arguments both ways. A trial by judge alone, uh, you don't have to explain every step to the same degree that you have to, to a jury. Uh, and um, the judge has to give reasons. A jury doesn't give reasons and therefore you've got generally no immediate hook on which to hang an argument of disquiet if you feel disquiet about uh, the outcome. Uh, my brother David uh, was a judge at the Supreme Court of New South Wales and he did wall-to-wall -wall murder. His, his work in the court was very substantially big criminal trials and he was very successful at it, very fair, and he said his experience was there was only one or two cases in all the years he was doing jury trials where he thought the jury got it wrong. He thought juries were a very good uh, mechanism for a fair conduct of the trial, fair outcomes, and they, he thought it was very rare that they, they got it wrong. Um, and of course, from the point of view of the, the working judge, um, once you've given your directions to the jury, which are now uh, to some degree in books of directions, um, you uh, don't have to go away and then write out a long judgment in which you set out the explanations for your decision. So it, it had an, it generally appealing against juries on the grounds of unsafe and unsatisfactory is quite a hard road to hoe and it generally uh, is, a, is an ingredient for finality which many people think is one of the great advantages of jury trial. David did concede, as Weinberg did in the Court of Appeal in Victoria, that occasionally juries get it wrong. Yes, so what he's talking about two in a period of what, 30, 20 years or something? Your brother? Yes, well, uh, it was uh, 90, uh, 98 to, to, yes, it was about 15 years. 15 years. Yeah. But, um, uh, well, of course, there were always exceptions, any, any yeah. general rule, but I think we should, not get into the mode uh, of throwing it out, throwing the system out because of one or two instances which leave the sense of disquiet and which are revealed and corrected. Um, because generally speaking, you see, you don't have just one person's opinion, you have 12 persons' opinion. And nowadays people are better educated and they're more inquisitive and they're more likely to uh, ask questions and to to um, have the matter uh, carefully analysed. Uh, so I, I think I think our system is a pretty good system, 
And the jury has traditionally been a protection of liberty. You never forget that Australia was uh, peopled by people who English juries had held had not stolen something worth more than two pound. If it was more than two pound, they'd be hanged. Uh, and many fine pieces of uh, jewellery and others were undervalued by the jury because they thought that that was an unfair law and uh, therefore Australia has a lot of people walking around who are the descendants of people who would have uh, not been here but for jury trial. So in the current climate where jury trials have been delayed in many jurisdictions because of the difficulties of holding them, um, what's the rights of the um, of the of the accused then? Well, it cuts both ways because there've been cases where the accused says, "I should get bail because of the fact that I'm going to be hanging around in prison waiting my trial," and uh, and yet Parliament has made it much more difficult for, for prisoners waiting trial to get bail and. Uh, so there are some interesting cases coming up now where uh, the judges are having to balance uh, the long-term deprivation of liberty against the risks of uh, flight or not uh, turning up for the trial. Um, but that too can uh, sometimes be dealt with by technological means of, uh, of uh, electronic devices that indicate where a person is that monitor the person. Uh, uh, however, um, uh, I think uh, the, the cases that are coming up in the courts uh, are addressing the issues where there's a clash between the right to speedy trial and uh, the delays that are caused by COVID-19. But the more fundamental problem is, uh, I don't, uh, I think it's very difficult to have close intimate and vigorous and sometimes contesting uh, discussion. One of the problems with COVID-19, I was told by my dermatologist the other day, is that dermatologists can't spend too much time with one person because being in the space uh, is the risk of the droplets and the droplets contain the virus and therefore you've got to break down the time that you're in another human being's space and that's difficult to do in a jury because however big the jury room or however big the room is that they substitute for an ordinary jury room, the, the dialectic is still going to be a, quite an intimate one. And some juries as you know are out for these days for a long, a long time, in some drug cases and some crime cases they can be out for three, four, five, six days, it's a long time. But they, they now allow juries to separate in ways that they didn't. You know, when I started out in the law, it was very common for juries to not to be allowed to separate. Once they had been sworn as the jury, they just had to stay together in case they pick up some information. Uh, and uh, today, that is a live problem with uh, media and um, the uh, internet allowing people access to information that they haven't got in the courtroom. And that, that is something against which judges will warn jurors, but uh, that uh, is a real live problem in today's world of media communications. Uh, well, that, that can't be resolved, you know, because no one takes juries, jurors, no one takes iPhones away from jurors these days, where in the past they were locked up once uh, very they frequently up, they were then allowed to go home where their iPhone was waiting for them. Yes. I, I think most people nowadays don't believe that they're alive if they don't have their iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in, in relation to, um, I mean, when, let's take a court like the High Court on which you're on or the Court of Appeal in New South Wales. So uh, to what extent, well, it might, well, let's take it might be a criminal case, it might be a civil case, but to what extent do the judges require to, I mean, they might be able to do it uh, by Zoom or by Microsoft Teams, but how often do they talk about these issues or do they go away separately and write their own papers or, or do they coalition with, with one another? Do they develop arguments with each other? I mean, what's the kind of system that's most 
most likely to prevail. The system in Australia, at least the system that I was familiar with, was that judges meet before they go into court in the first place and for a short meeting and they talk about their initial impressions of the case. Uh, they then uh, may have lunch together or may not. Uh, they will then have a meeting at the end of the day and have a discussion. In the High Court of Australia, because the judge didn't live in the same uh, state and didn't uh, have the advantage of being available in chambers all the time, uh, they had a system uh, of um, conferencing, uh, which was on the Tuesday after the two-week session uh, that you uh, had for sittings. Uh, the High Court's schedule is rather similar to Parliament. And, and you would, you're on for two weeks and then you're off for two weeks when you're supposed to be writing the judges. Uh, but uh, in that period, uh, at the beginning of that period, there would be a, 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 an audio-visual link to uh, a, a closely confined and secure link to the chambers of the Chief Justice, who was then in Sydney, uh, and to uh, the judges in their chambers throughout the Commonwealth and there would be discussion about the case and uh, discussion about who should be invited to write the first opinion in the case. So uh, that is a technology that is available uh, to deal with the problem of distant communication. So that's there before the virus, that's, that's yes, there. The High Court has really been a, a path finder in this technology and you know I, when I was on the Court of Appeal as I was for 12 years before I went to the High Court we never had any audiovisual communication uh, uh, advocacy or anything uh, uh, but um, when I went to the High Court it only took about 10 minutes to get used to it you, you, you're, you were being to the courthouse in Adelaide there it was at the bench, uh, the, the bar table in Adelaide. All the barristers were in their wigs and robes. They would get up and make their submissions and the camera pans in and goes straight to the advocate. So it's very similar to the advocate being in front of you in the courtroom. And sometimes it's even better because the uh, audio is better and, and clearer and stronger. Yeah. If, if, as, as I went on, I got, like my grandfather, a little bit hard of hearing, uh, it was actually an advantage uh, that you could get the very clear audio and very clear visual. Now, that's the case with a Court of Appeal. Um, what about a Court of First Instance? What about if there's a witness? Um, does it matter whether the witness is coming through on video or the witness is present in the court? Do you think that... Well, I mean, it might be the accused or it might be a witness. Some judges are very traditional now. My former brother, McHugh, Justice Michael McHugh, was very traditional. He said, you have to be in the presence, you have to feel the atmosphere, you've got to know. The only problem with that theory was there's an awful lot of science that has looked at it and people cannot judge the truth-telling of a witness by how impressive they are and how they look you in the eye and how they're very direct. Uh, that, that is a complete furphy and uh, uh, therefore once you start looking at the science, get to the point, as the High Court has in its decision, the very famous decision of Fox against Percy, in which the court says it's better to have an ounce of evidence than uh, many pounds of impression because impression can be wrong. And this is a problem, say, with Aboriginal witnesses. They don't like looking you in the eye. Their culture is not to look you in the eye. Uh, and they speak very softly and quietly and avert their eyes. There are cultural norms in some European communities which are similar. In Asia, people generally speak to people of power with great deference, and uh, not always, but sometimes. And therefore, <clears throat> Some of, the, um, some of the truths of the past need to be re-examined. So I don't, think, I don't think witnesses would be much of a problem. Uh, and it's interesting that in the federal court, which is mainly civil jurisdiction, 
they haven't had any problem. 80% of their trials are going ahead in the normal way with video links and the, the, the judge might be in one place and the barrister in a different place and the witness in a third place. And, and this is just how you can get on with, with the litigation and so not when, hold it up. So when a, when a judge goes away to consider uh, a case, what you suggested is probably that the transcripts of more value than an impression given either directly in a court or by video link. Well, I wouldn't want to overemphasize this because, you know, you, you, you don't have a lot of time to sit there and go through it again and again and again looking at material. Sometimes it might be useful, but, um, and I noticed that in the uh, appeal in the High Court uh, concerning Cardinal Pell, there was a question of whether the Court of Appeal of Victoria was wrong in going to the uh, video uh, material which had been available of the complaint uh, in that case. But uh, if material is available, then, and if it's part of the record, then there's no reason in principle why a judge and a jury shouldn't be allowed to see that and uh, see it repeated, including over and over again if it's critical. Well, I think in the, in the Pell case in the Court of Appeal, the majority of judges, two of them, said, well, you look at the complainant, and the complainant is convincing, compelling, and the minority judge said, you look at the complaint and the complaint is not existing. So I think the, the court's there saying, well, you better look better looking at the evidence rather than getting impressions about how people sound, which I think is consistent with what you're saying, but, but not so much of what Malcolm McHugh was saying. Yes, well, I think the High Court has, uh, in Fox against Percy, and in many cases since, uh, has uh, said that uh, nowadays, uh, witnesses um, uh, will not necessarily be accepted just because they look impressive. And it's much better to put the, the thing together. We had a case in High Court, Mallard's case, uh, and in that case it came up seeking special leave and the bench of three, which include Michael McHugh and me, refused special leave. And then ten years later they came back uh, and Justice Edelman, was junior counsel uh, in the case and they argued uh, on the basis that when you put all the evidence together it didn't fit and in that case uh, I sat, I offered to recuse myself but they said no we're quite happy for you to sit. I was the last of the three who were still sitting and um, uh, the court found that, that it didn't fit and Mr Mallard was not only not really proved to be guilty, he was probably actually innocent, which is not the search in our system. Our search is not, is the accused innocent, but has the Crown proved the accused is guilty beyond reasonable doubt? We'll finish in a minute before anyone is it that, That's a Western Australian case, isn't it, Mallard? Yes, Mallard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Mallard later was knocked down on the road and killed, mm -hmm. but at least uh, his case came to justice in the end. It's a case which explains the burden that a judge faces if you have any sensitivity to think that I was guilty in, uh, 10 years earlier in refusing special leave on the basis of the arguments that were put then. I didn't have the benefit of the argument that was ultimately put, which was it is not logical, it does not fit together, it cannot be consistent with rationality. Now, since your days in the Law Reform Commission, influential days, but you've been calling for reform with some success, and today, again, you're suggesting some further changes that could be made coming off COVID-19 in order to make um, trials less expensive, because you make the point um, most sensible people wouldn't go into court if they knew what they were going to experience here in terms of cost or whatever. Um, what chances do you think of some of these changes you've been talking today coming about? I think there is a good chance that they will come about. I think the fact that the law and the bench reacted so positively, they had to because of the fact that COVID-19 is passed by close communication and therefore they had to find a way 
and the technology had suddenly become available of uh, Zoom and Teams uh, and uh, that made it possible. And that isn't a big change. That's the problem I have with Professor Suskin. He thinks because everybody went there in their wigs and robes and did it by video that everybody now wants to change everything. Well, lawyers aren't like that. Lawyers are very suspicious, including myself. You've got to make sure that you're not changing something that is there for a really good and important purpose. But uh, uh, there's no doubt that there would be cases, types of cases, cases involving government claim, claims against government and departments where they're mass produced. China couldn't cope with its population unless it had some systems for dealing with things quickly and cheaply, and maybe not perfectly. But uh, we have to uh, think of what we can do. I had a case recently with a neighbour uh, when I was purchasing a, a property, and, and I found out very quickly how much it would cost if I would take my very reasonable grievance to a court and it was totally prohibitive. I couldn't afford it. I would, I would be a fool to, to do it. And so I didn't. And in the end, it was disposed of. But if that affects a well-heeled gentleman like me, it certainly would affect many people, including people who are affected by COVID and the economic impact of the epidemic. Michael Kirby, many thanks. Thank you, Jerry.